from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome, I'm Michelle Stefano, I'm a Folklife Specialist at the American Folklife Center here at the Library of Congress. We're in the Coolidge Auditorium in the Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress. And just a little while ago, we were treated to a series of dance battles organized by Urban Artistry, a nonprofit organization based in Silver Spring. And I'm fortunate to be joined by its founding executive director, Junius Brickhouse. And would you mind introducing who else we have here on stage? Yes, absolutely. Um, this is uh, Ryan, Future Web. And Baron Hawk Portier Williams and Rashad Hassani Pearson. And so, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but what brings you all together is Urban Artistry, this organization. So, um, Junius, just so people have a better understanding, what exactly does Urban Artistry do? Well, Urban Artistry is a nonprofit dedicated to the preservation of urban dance culture uh, in its simple form. Um, in a more complex idea. Um, we're trying our best to be ambassadors of our cultures and of our communities and um, do our best to preserve what we're doing now and what's been done before um, we came along. So in short, yeah. And how would you describe what urban dance is? So that's, that's a question that's always like, um, that we get a lot and the answer is always changing. You know, as this is, uh, living culture, you know, um, you know, ideally when we first started urban dance culture, saying urban dance was something that we wanted to say to get out of saying street dance all the time, especially since there was a connotation to that, you know, and, you know, I knew a lot of talented people who were um, definitely ambassadors of the culture that weren't from the street at all. So um, kind of thought it was polarizing, and I thought that it kind of put us under a different light, you know, something that wasn't really us. So saying urban dance culture allowed us to um, be authentic to wherever we came from and the cultures that we wanted to express, so. And you founded Urban Artistry in 2005. Yes, in 2005, that was where the work began. You know, um, it was uh, a contemplated effort on, on how we could see all the people in our, in our community that weren't dancing professionally, that were dancing in the clubs, that may not have been uh, professional dancers or world famous. How can we get them involved? Um, not just in uh, this, this industry, but to hear their stories and, and find about find out about where they're from and the things that they were doing and what made them tick and to see how broad our, our culture and our communities actually were. So um, it was an effort to not just uh, dance together but to start the documentation process of, of who are we in all these different communities and, and telling our stories. Um, so it, it started, um, when we started it was about eight of us and um, Ryan wasn't with us just yet. We knew who Ryan was, but uh, um, he was away at school yeah. like during that time. <laughs> but um, definitely uh, Baron, Baron Hawk and, and Rashad were there. And uh, it sounds kind of funny now, but like back then in my head, it was simple. It was like, you know, a lot of these people were really talented, you know. Um, but they don't have all the tools. I have some tools, I don't have all of them, but if I could share those tools and I could kind of open up what I'm doing so they can see what I'm doing, maybe together we can move forward and I could do for them what people had done for me in the past and basically giving me an opportunity to be more than just a, a club kid or you know somebody hanging out in, at competitions and you know, just broaden it out. And I saw a mistake, like, well, to me, it seemed like a mistake. It seemed like everyone was having fun, 
um, but people weren't very serious about what it is that they were doing. Like, dance was about fun to them. You know, it was about being cool, and you know. And I grew up dancing culturally. It was my culture. It was my identity. Um, the way we dress, the way we talk, you know, the movement we did, the music we listened to, and even if it was different types of music, you know, we all of those things I felt like was me. It was my identity. So those tools, you know, and these ways of thinking, you know, I just put it out and shared it with these young people and. You know, the snag was, okay, once you, you, you share the idea or you provide some opportunities, like, how do you get them to reciprocate? So the, the idea was, hey, okay, if, if we start this project, you know, what you have to do is you have to do for others what I'm doing for you right now. And that's going to change. But if we stay in service to each other, like, we can enrich our communities. Um, and that was the beginning. Yeah. Well, I'd like to get a little personal with each of you. Uh, so uh -oh. 2005, you started Urban Artistry, <laughs> but take me back to your beginnings with respect to learning about and immersing yourself and becoming brought into urban dance culture. Where, where are you from? What yeah. were the early days like? So for me, the early days were, were simple. Um, I started dancing like with my family at home, you know, like a lot of us did. You know, I think, I mean, dance was a way for me to connect, you know, um, with my with my mom, you know, and to be able to have a voice, you know, like and it made her smile, it made her happy. So I remember just connecting to that um, and being around people who danced, you know. Um, it was just kind of what we did. I don't think that I really, I would say like all through until I graduated from high school, like all of the, on, on a daily basis, we were dancing in our hallways or dancing like in the court, you know, where we lived, you know, like go to recreation centers, basketball courts, wherever people were playing music and talent shows and like competitions for kids, you know, we would, frequent those things all the time. I don't think it was until I moved outside of my community that I realized that not everybody dances. <laughs> like, so when I, I think when I moved uh, away from Virginia and joined the military, I realized that like a lot of people couldn't dance. <laughs> and a lot of people weren't really serious about it. Like people were like, dancing was funny to them. You know, so people would dance around and they make fun of things and I'd be like, that ain't funny, you know, like, it's, why are you making fun? You know, like, it, it felt wrong to me because I, I connected with that. You know, when you connect with something and it becomes a part of you and you see someone mistreat it, you know, or not give it the respect due, you have a response. So that's what dance was like for me as a kid and, and becoming an adult and having a, a certain affection for those good old days where, you know, and as a soldier, I could no longer have the same, you know, childlike mind, so to speak, and I couldn't express myself through dance in that way, at least not, you know, culturally, I felt like, you know, I, I was a soldier, I wasn't a dancer anymore, you know, so, but even though I was still dancing, you know, dance even became in the military envi environment, it came, became a, even more so important to me, um, hence starting to do this kind of work um, towards preservation and, and documentation, you know, about dance. Yeah, and we'll get to that in a moment. Okay. So you grew up in Virginia Beach in Norfolk, uh, Virginia area. Mm -hmm. um, set the scene a little bit more, paint the picture. Uh, what was the music that your mom was playing? Oh, what were maybe the first dances or styles that uh, yeah. you learned? Yeah, so the music, definitely music of, uh, I was born in 74, so like, you know, the music they were, my mom was listening to, like, um, it changed throughout, like, the week. You know, like, the weekdays was uh, cleaning music. So that was like the R&B stuff, like, that was... You know, mostly uh, stuff like 
I don't know, like Minnie Rippleton, you know, uh, Blue Magic, uh, <laughs> you know, Aretha Franklin, like, you know, uh, Gladys Knight, you know. And the weekends would bring, as we got closer to Friday, the music got faster. You know, we got, <laughs> there was a lot more funk, a lot more disco, you know, and yeah. So that was the music that, that we grew, I grew up on as a child. I, don't, I think that maybe by the time I was, you know, eight or nine years old, I started to find my own identity with music. And like, you know, the rap thing started to get like really popular and, you know, we didn't like a lot of that, you know, like the stuff that you could dance to we liked, you know. It was rap then, it's hip hop now, but at first we, a lot of us kids didn't like it because it wasn't really dance music or at least dance that we identified with, you know. So the music that, you know, some of the first dances that, that I did, you know, was, you know, the funky robot, the breakdown, you know, all that stuff from, from Rufus Thomas, you know, and my mom liked stacks, so like that was a lot of the stuff that she played as well. And they actually had names of dances like the funky chicken and you know, all that stuff. So by by the time 77, 78 rolled around, you know, I was old enough to comprehend, you know, that stuff that it came years before. And yeah, so when I started to get my own identity in dance, I started doing like uh, talent shows and, and rec center like competitions and then just regular like call out battles like that we used to do in our neighborhoods or at other projects, you know, with other dancers, you know. And it really wasn't a big deal then, like, but it was free, you know. And like a lot of us can afford like to be on football teams or basketball teams, like so, you know, we had groups of people who, who danced and hung out, so. Uh, a while back, you were also mentioning to me how there was this um, kind of a separation mm -hmm. between proper, official, in quotes, mm -hmm. dance schools, and then the school that occurred on the streets and in the neighborhoods in terms of learning from mentors, mm -hmm. joining or being brought into dance crews. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's an alternative school uh, that was yeah. so often uh, the school for <clears throat> poor African-American kids. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, that, I think that, that was definitely the case for me. Um, it's different for some other people. But for me, um, in Norfolk, you know, there weren't a lot of places where a little black boy like myself could go and, go and fit in, even if we could afford it. You know, it wasn't like a very welcoming environment. Um, so we, for us, the best dancers were people that we knew, you know, and people that we would see on TV on the old UHF channels, like, you know, um, I was always a Bill Robertson fan, you know, like I always admired that, you know, he was teaching Shirley Temple, you know, <laughs> like, and I was like, oh, that's an older man teaching, like, a little person, like, he's helping her with dance, and that seemed like something, that I was like, wow, that was really nice, you know, just like my mom, my mom helps me with dance, you know, like, and I would always imagine, well, what happened if, you know, I could be, you know, a star, and I'd be on TV too, like this, and it was like, nah, that's not really a thing. You know, we really didn't think that, that something like this would be possible, you know? Not because we weren't great dancers, but because our scope wasn't there. We didn't have people around us that told us, hey, yeah, you know, you're gonna be famous one day, dancing. No, I don't think anyone ever said that, like, as a kid. I'm not saying I need to hear it, though. You know, but it just says that there's a difference, like pre-professional programming and, and, and dance education is, is set up in different communities in different ways. And uh, I don't think, uh, you know, I'm glad that, that my path was that way. You know, it, it taught me to, to respect um, my community, where my community is the people that, that helped me as well as this idea that, that dance is, uh, it's not recreational, you know, it's, it's cultural, you know, and it's, it's deeper. It's not something you use to, you know, um, it only advance yourself, you know. You can use it to, to elevate people and advance other people's, you know, quality of life, you know. And 
It's something that can be learned with patience and through sitting down. And it doesn't rest in a building somewhere like you go to a dance school and you can, you leave and then, you know, you're informed. You know, no, you can get the information anywhere with someone who wants to share it with you. You know, so that's, yeah. That's great, thank you. Uh, how about Rashad? Uh, what's your story? What, what brought you into urban, the rich and, and, and varied urban dance traditions? Um, it's a really good question. I think uh, for me, my story starts in New York City. Um, born and raised there in Queens and in Harlem. And so um, specifically, I just remember like being a little boy in colonial projects, like trying to imitate my sister, you know? She had a group called the Roofless Violators. And <laughs> every summer, um, and she's gonna kill me for saying this on camera, but, but every, every summer uh, we would have like family day. And so in the back, which was the park with the courts and stuff, there would be like a talent show and her and her group would get up there and dance. And it was primarily like hip hop music, you know, a lot of Rob bass, a lot of Kwame, Queen Latifah, things like this. And so they were doing um, the hip hop, like social steps of the time, um, but in choreography. And then in between that, there was basketball games and it was food. And most of us young kids were like playing on the monkey bars or like climbing under the bleachers, you know, but the music was there and the people were there and everything was just so vibrant. Um, in addition to that, like I think very similar to Junius is that um, my parents played a lot of music around the house. Um, and Sundays were, were the days that I remember the most um, because I knew it was a good day if I woke up and I smelled pancakes and my dad was playing the Dells or like the Delphonics or, mm -hmm. and you just heard these, the, the what are they called, like the oldies, you know, mm -hmm. the classic music and like he wouldn't wake me up to clean something, you know. And, and every, every day, whatever the music was, it just depended on their mood. And like, I just, I just remember singing and dancing, you know, trying to, trying to do what they were doing. Um, I, don't, I don't think I, I got like fully aware of, of what I was doing until I moved away from the city. Um, and I moved down here, which was, I think I was 19. So it was 2003. Um, and I started uh, trying to uh, find a community of people to, to attach myself to, you know, um, 19. I didn't really have a plan. I didn't know where I was going next. I, I was just kind of like walking aimlessly. And I found, um, there was a, it's actually where Baron and me met, but it was called the DC Baltimore Pop Shop. And there were two groups that ran it. It was Liquid Pop Collective, and it was the Boogie Nights. Um, and uh, yeah, these guys like showed us fundamentals in the styles of like boogalooing and popping and locking. And I was just like in awe, like just such a fan of it. But because I was so excited for it, it you know, I, I, really tr I really tried to practice as hard as I could to get it so I could fit into these, these guys that were teaching me these things. Um, uh, but 2005, I think my life took a turn in terms of really being uh, fully aware of, of where I was going and what I wanted to do. And it was when I met Junius. Um, we actually met not too, not too far from here at a nightclub um, through a gentleman um, from the Boogie Nights. Um, and uh, from there, it was like being a part of urban artistry and being a part of our crew. Like we, oh, man, my education just was so rapid. Like I grew so fast because I was finally getting tools that uh, helped me represent what I was learning when I was a kid, um, helped me to figure out what I was trying to do that day and then where I wanted to go 10, 20, 30 years from now. And I think like that was probably the, the, the biggest part of like my, my growth as an artist and as a dancer. Um, so that's, that's kind of like the short version to my story, um, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, how about you? Um, so I, uh, I was born in 87, I'm gonna date myself. Um, uh, baby. I'm baby, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, 
So I, but I'm the, uh, the youngest of seven, or the second youngest of eight. Um, and uh, so my, my older siblings were all dancers in their own way. Um, so I picked up a lot of early hip hop social dances. I remember uh, my sister and my cousin taught me uh, the Roger Rabbit and the Running Man on our back patio. And I will never forget that, you know, that day. Um, but that's kind of where my, just picking up steps and you just, my mom loved to dance, my mom loved to sing, and she kind of, she never had a chance to pursue her own artistic uh, goals and careers, but she always allowed all of her children to do that. And she always pushed us. Um, if we liked anything, if we showed even just 10% of interest in anything, she would go and buy you know, something to go push it and, you know, and ask us to do something with it. Um, so we have you know, VHS tapes of my older siblings on stage doing dances and you know, being in performances. Um, some of my sisters are, are artists, visual artists, and you know, whatever else. Uh, so for me, it was just kind of, I was always surrounded by that. Um, and my father was, he loved collecting music. That was his thing with all types of music, world music, country. I always made fun of him because he was the only person in the house that loved country and he <laughs> played it all the time. Uh, but so I was exposed to a lot of different things um, from a young age and it was natural. It was never, um, never looked at as, as weird, like, oh, we're, you know, you're listening to weird music or, you know, this and the other. Everything was acceptable, you know, mm -hmm. every, every, you know, it was, it was cool. Um, so when I, uh, I started really picking up uh, dances and, and uh, I started breaking in 2001 when I was a freshman in high school, uh, me and my friends just decided to take over a couple hallways every two or three days, you know, out of the week, every uh, after school, and we would just practice. Hmm. Um, we didn't really, you know, sports weren't really a big thing for our group. Um, video games were, but we realized that dance was something that we really connected with and we really enjoyed doing and we, we practiced it so much so um, that now I'm here in, you know, in the Library of Congress practicing <laughs> the same, same dance moves. Um, but it was in 2005 when, uh, when I graduated that I, I met uh, Junius as well. Um, and we actually met uh, via a battle, actually. I had called him out um, just as a friendly exchange. Uh, and you know, he smoked me, but it, it, was, it, was, <laughs> it was intriguing because I was, I was practicing a dance style that wasn't popular um, in this area and that dance style was locking. Um, and there wasn't really anybody else practicing that, that dance style. So when I saw somebody else doing it, and he was black, I was like, oh, what? <laughs> this is amazing. I had, like, you know, it, 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 it blew my mind. And so we, you know, we developed a kinship very, very quickly from that, that moment. Um, and, and now we're, we're working on a professional company. Yeah, you're the artistic yeah. director of Urban Artistry. I'm one of, one of the artistic directors. Uh, I'm also DJing uh, for the group. Uh, it's one of the DJs. For the group, I've picked up producing music as well. Um, there's a lot, <laughs> a lot, a lot has happened. Mm -hmm. You mentioned two really important words, battling mm -hmm. and also locking. Would you mind describing what they are? Sure, um, uh, I'll start with locking. Locking is a, a dance style from, uh, from California, from the West Coast. Uh, started late 60s and the early 70s. Um, it's actually one of the, the, uh, the second dance style in the battle, if you go back in the archive and watch the battle. Um, it's, uh, it's a very expressive dance, um, to say the least. It's a very uh, um, explosive dance. It's an, uh, one of the upright styles where you're, you're kind of on your feet. You can take it down to the floor, but um, it's mostly an, an upright dance style. And because you're asked to be upright, it's kind of awkward for people. Um, and the motions behind it, there's a lot of arm movement um, associated with it. And it's, very, it's different from popping, where popping is, is more uh, illusion based, um, where you're, you're making people believe that you're a robot. You're making them believe that there's something traveling through your body and you know, you're making your, your body look like it's actual liquid. Locking is not. <laughs> there's nothing illusion based around it. Uh, it's just a very fun party dance. Um, uh, battling is uh, the competition aspect of dance. So this is, uh, you and I, or my group and your group, exchanging rounds back and forth for, if it's in an organized battle, it's for a time limit. If it's uh, in a club, it's whoever gives up first, 
or whoever concedes, whoever's mature enough to concede that they uh, have lost this battle. But uh, you're, you're exchanging dance moves to see who has a better understanding of the dance, who has the most vocabulary of the dance, who's been practicing it the most, uh, who is able to take the dance and show you the fundamentals, but then also be able to flip the fundamentals and show you, hey, this is what the dance could be, and this is the advanced portion of the dance. And that's what battling should be. That's what battling should be. Wow. Yeah. I, I know today was an organized battle, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. There was set time, even though we went over, which was <laughs> fine, right? It happens. <laughs> but, yeah. but I'm really, I'm really intrigued about being called yeah. out in clubs. Mm. How often does that happen to you? Or, oh. uh, any funny stories? Did you ever kill, uh, you know, uh, excuse me, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean uh, smoke. Oh. Did you we ever never smoke someone? <laughs> <laughs> I meant that figuratively. <laughs> but uh, anyone? Uh, uh, sh sure. I'll, yeah, okay. I'll and then you can talk about your story. Okay, cool. You're getting into dance. Um, yeah, I've been in plenty of call-out battles. Um, I, I started as a b-boy and a popper, and at that time, which was early 2000s, it was sort of the era of organized contests coming in. But the tradition of like call outs and hey, I want to test my skills against you and see where I'm at and see where you're at, or hey, I want to check your ego. Maybe you've been saying some things, or maybe like you need to put some action behind those words and let's see what you got. Like this sort of like healthy competition was still around. So I've done plenty. Um, I'll give you a little scenario of one that happened recently. Um, so there was someone that was saying, hey, I don't know if like you should be teaching kids. Maybe you're not qualified. Maybe your group's not qualified to teach kids. And I was like, that's ridiculous. Like, I know my people. We can teach. We know our stuff. We know our history. We've learned the culture. We know foundation, multiple styles. Like, why, why wouldn't we be able to teach kids? So I said, OK, well, if this guy thinks that he's more qualified or he wants to say something like that about my organization, I'm gonna test his skills and see where he's at, right? Let the action speak louder than the words. So I actually used via internet. So this is something new that's happening, right? Before it would be like you, me, now, when you see him. And that could happen anywhere, on the street, in the club, at an organized event, whatever. But this one was kind of like, hey, I'm calling this guy out. I wanted to prove a point and I wanted people to know, hey, this is what's happening my solution to solve this conflict is to exchange in movement and then talk about it afterwards. So we met at a club. We went 18 rounds each. No time limit, no picking of the music, just whatever the DJ was playing, and shook hands at the end, and that was that. But who won? <laughs> I did. <laughs> I did. It's a I good story to, to tell. Yeah. Think... So uh, if I may, what, what brought you into urban uh, dance culture? <laughs> so, OK. My mother originally was my first dance teacher, not urban dance. She's a ballerina, and she does some Broadway jazz. So when I was little, she used to have me performing at church. We would do little gymnastics, little formations, and little like jazz runs and things, simple things like that. I eventually said, hey, mom, this is just not cool. I'm going to play <laughs> sports, and this is not going to be my thing anymore. You know? And she was upset about that, but what she did when I was about 14, 15, she tricked me by showing me Michael Jackson music videos, right? And just showing me that kind of got me back into it. And she didn't say, oh, do this. It was just like, oh, look at this video. So, right, that was the smart way to get me back into it. So, you know, that sort of mainstream um, pop culture and what was being done on TV inspired me in the very beginning to start moving like a popper with um, robotics and tick motion and gliding in the feet. Um, I was also into the movies Breakin' and Beat Street. I found those next, and I wanted to break as well. And there was always boogie boys in those videos. There were poppers and, and b-boys. So I was like, these are my two things, right? I, um, I grew up in Northern Virginia, out in Ashburn near Dulles Airport. So suburb, right? Not in an urban setting. Uh, hence the, the mainstream media influence. And I told my mom, I was like, hey, I want to go to this competition I saw online. There was a dance competition. This was about 2000. So we drove out to DC. I went to a, a b-boy contest that was happening at, at a local dance studio. And um, I started taking classes um, from the b-boy instructors at the studio. 
and I um, eventually joined a group at the time called Pure Energy and Back to Basics, and we started going to some of the first local battles in the area. The first one I went to was called Breaker's Delight. Um, that's where I met some of the people in the group. Um, and then two years later, they did the same event with a popping contest, and I entered that contest. So in the beginning, dance for me was very much, I want to win these battles. I want to do cool movements aesthetically that look amazing and drop people's jaws and impress people. Um, and the longer that I did it, the more dancers that I met, I started to realize there was more of a culture to this thing. Specifically, after I, I moved to California for college, I was dancing with some people out there, but before I left, I met Rashad in um, 2005, and we had a, a practice session together just one time. We had a mutual friend that was a dancer. We practiced together one time, and then we kept in touch a little bit while I was in California. Every summer, I would come home to spend my, my two months over here um, before I would go back, and me and Rashad started training together. And um, Rashad <clears throat> was already carrying the mentality of urban artistry, which is like, again, like we want to have fun with dance, but you know, let's take it seriously. Let's let's do dance research. Let's be anthropologists about dance. Let's learn to be leaders within the community. Um, let's learn history and culture. And he he's my mentor within the group, and he started breaking some of those elements down for me teaching me about the purpose of the cipher, the purpose of the community, how to treat each other in that environment, and breaking down a lot of the details um, that like as an outsider of the culture, I wouldn't really have known. You know, So for me, it was important that, that I did meet Rashad and, and have the relationship that we have, because he kind of coached me through that and, and made things clear for me. Um, also, so that I could be respectful of um, being like Euro European American learning and African American tradition. Um, and since then, like, my growth has doubled, tripled, just keeps going up because now we're looking, well, now I'm looking at it from a more holistic approach. It's not just about movement, you know. It's, it's everything that comes involved with the culture. Let's dig deep in all of those different elements and not just isolate one, you know. Let's put it all together and see, see it for what it is. And I think that has helped me to really grow into my own within the culture and um, yeah, helped me to become a leader within the community as well and urban artistry. Well, you bring up this idea of researching and being folklorists or anthropologists. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious, I know Baron Hawk, you're from the DC metro area mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. You're from New York and, and the suburbs of the DC mm -hmm. metro area. Um, I'm wondering about the importance of place and particular styles. And if there are any distinctive styles to New York, I mean, I know the answer is yes, and as well as here, but just the musical traditions of these areas, how did that influence you? And is there that uniqueness of place that also was an influence in, in your lives? Um, so I, I, I grew up in, um, in Beltsville, which is in Prince George's County. Um, and the, the unique thing about that part of Prince George's County is I lived right off of 95. So I kind of lived in between Baltimore, Baltimore and uh, DC. So I was getting um, Baltimore club music when I was a kid. And then at the same time, I would flip a radio station and I would hear DC go-go. Um, and hearing both of those different, very, very different types of music mm -hmm. happening at the same time, um, it, it it kind of, it, it, well, I was already listening to a lot of different types of music already, but it helped, um, helped me understand my area even more and, and helped me understand how diverse uh, Maryland and DC really are. Um, from Baltimore Club music, you, you know, they would also mix in some house music as well, so you would hear a lot of, uh, a lot of, we didn't even realize that they were classic Chicago house songs. We just thought that they, we would think that they were just Baltimore Club songs, but you know, like the percolator would, would be mixed in and dropped, it's just because it was such a very popular song, it would get mixed in and dropped in, and that's actually Chicago house music. And there were a lot of songs like that. Um, you would catch a lot of uh, Chicago DJs actually uh, working in Baltimore, and they would be playing a lot of Chicago house music, so you would get a taste of that. And then uh, on the DC side, um, go-go music is essentially, if you, in the long run, if you, if you think about it, it's the story of hip hop in DC. That's our, 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 our version of it. And uh, so through that, I got into 
uh, R and B, and they were you know they were uh, covering a lot of R and B songs, a lot of popular R and B songs, a lot of popular hip hop songs of the day, a lot of rap songs of the day. So you, I, I was exposed to a lot of different things just listening to our local radio stations, you know, that were playing the unique music here, and those two genres were only here, you know. That's, that's just two, and they, you know, New York had a million things going on. Philly had their own music. Um, even down south, uh, North Carolina had you know something going on. Miami, of course, had had their own thing going on. Um, so locales and, and regions definitely change uh, uh, music, and they change culturally, and and it's it's fascinating mm -hmm. listening to it. And I, I know that there are many different origin stories mm -hmm. for some of these styles, but I think one story is that b-boying mm -hmm. is somehow and b-girling. <laughs> is uh, is uh, uh, what, this one story? It's very much connected to the Bronx, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Is that any? Is, would you, Rashad, like to speak a little bit about that, or breaking, yeah. or? Thank you. I can so I can speak a little bit about that. Um, I'm not a practitioner of the style, but um, I've paid attention to it for enough years. Um, so it is it is one of of many um, urban dances that come from like a underprivileged neighborhood. Um, I think Mean said it really nice, like earlier, about like uh, in terms of how it, it, it evolved um, from like a two-step, and then you you start to build it, and you step out, and maybe you'll just drop to the floor, and and someone would stay on the floor a little bit longer, and then a little bit longer, and people started to build from each other. Um, I think people get inspired by what's around them, and I think that's really important. Um, Sometimes you don't see the bigger picture. Like a large picture is down the block. Going downtown is a big deal, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, and I remember growing up in Harlem, like we weren't even allowed to even go up the Ave, you know? I was like, no, nah, you can't go down there because there's trouble or whatever. And so making it is going to the Rucker. Making it is, is being famous in your neighborhood. And so I think a, a through line for most of the dances is gonna be that. Um, when, when you start to move forward and things start to become not so isolated to the community, um, this is where there's a lot more cultural exchanges. So when Barron is talking about how Chicago house music is inserted in Baltimore City, you know, um, but people in Baltimore think it's a, a Baltimore thing. They don't realize, like, mm. well, wait a minute. We're actually learning something about someone else's culture. And it's the same thing that was happening in the Bronx. You know, people were infusing the, the Latin hustle. People were doing the rock dance. People were b-boying and b-girling. And so there were so many different types of music. There was salsa and merengue and funk and jazz. And like, it was, it was just black music. It was, <laughs> it was just that like there wasn't like I don't remember growing up hearing someone say oh you're doing this dance style or you're yeah. doing this this is this music this yeah. is funk or this is it was just it was just what was played you know and like oh play that old song oh I remember how that felt you know mm -hmm. and so there was a lot of that um, and that was that was our higher intelligence that was how we we shared with each other um, and it's continually happening today. And yeah, so I, I think, I think um, boogalooing, locking, house, hip hop, whacking, punking, I mean, you can go through all the different urban dances and common story will be that. So let's uh, go back to urban artistry. And um, I thank you guys so much. You've painted such a picture of this rich web, uh, interconnected <laughs> web of all these styles and genres and their evolution and exchanging. Um, so how does urban artistry tackle that? Because I know you're not just in the business of teaching, right? Mm -hmm. You've mentioned earlier there's research. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that you, you use this term citizen folklorist that you've coined, uh, <laughs> that you know, you, you're all researchers and understanding the roots and these, these multiple stories. So uh, wh how does that play out with urban artistry, this research arm? So I, I think it starts with the, the idea of having people respect who they are first. You know, um, doing research about um, other people 
in their culture and their communities and the things that they like and they enjoy is always good. But I, I honestly don't think you truly can do that without knowing self. You know, I mean, and, and the reason why I say that is because to learn something about someone else, you'll find things that you disagree with. You'll be like, oh no, I don't really like that. Or that's strange, or that's weird, you know? And if you don't feel like you know yourself enough and that you care about yourself enough to allow yourself to be imperfect, it's gonna be really difficult to accept and understand other people's imperfections. So I, I wanted to start there. Um, it's, you know, when you want to teach, you know, um, a white kid from Ashburn, you know, <laughs> about like um, what's going on in the projects in, in Memphis, Tennessee, like, it's important to, to teach him to, to love himself, you know, and to respect what he has to bring to the table and what he's learned in his communities and what he grew up with, because that's valuable too. You know, it, it's not this idea that just because brown people are doing it, it's more important. You know, like, I don't think that's the case. You know, I think it's beautiful because it's beautiful, you know, and it has very little to do with the people who are doing it. You know, it has something to do with the soul and the culture behind it, you know. So I think that's where, where we try to start, you know, and bringing that to an organization, you know, means that we have these different arms and these different directorates where we can encourage that. And I'll, I'll let you talk about that since you're our director of education. <laughs> sure. So. In, in terms of like research, we have a project we call the Preservatory Project. And basically, it's what Junius was just explaining. It's about reaching out to often what we consider unsung heroes within the uh, arts communities, urban arts communities, not just dance. Um, and we want to share their stories, um, not only to give others a more holistic approach of who's out there and what's available in terms of information. Um, because sometimes even within our, um, our, I don't want to call it underground community, but the subculture that we know of, there still becomes these sort of trendy things that happen and um, certain people get more limelight than others. So we basically wanted to shine light in the places where they weren't being shined and allow those people also to document their own stories from their voices, not someone else telling their story. So um, one chapter that, that we do is called Boogaloo Traditions, um, and that is specifically for the popping and boogaloo section um, that myself and Rashad kind of spearhead. So um, we've done some, some really nice interviews so far with different people like Damon Frost and uh, Boogaloo Dana and Boogaloo Vic from Oakland, um, Regis from Paris, Sensei Bop from South Central LA. And basically it's, it's been a really nice thing because not only are they able to share what, what um, they've been through and add their perspective into the, the overall story, but it's also just a learning experience in general. I'm really learning a lot from doing it because I'm gaining knowledge at the same time. The things that they're talking about are actually inspiring me. Um, and we try to give that back by staying connected with these people. You know, we bring them out for our events and try to honor them in different ways. And, you know, if they would like, we put that information out to kind of promote them and hopefully give them some, some work and different things and more attention. So. Um, that's basically what we're doing in the Preservatory Project. We also have um, the Urban Artistry Dance Academy where we um, have workshops and, and classes like throughout the week um, to teach these styles. Um, we also have um, a program, a project that we're doing. Um, it's a genome project that we started doing informally where a lot of us are getting our DNA done and doing our family histories and um, connecting with someone else in the group who might not be from that culture and sharing that experience with them. Um, 
not just the actual results, but actually art that comes from there. Um, just an effort to, to keep us growing, because I think as Americans, like uh, sometimes we get into that groove, like, you know, we're just Americans, you know? <laughs> like we're just Americans, and that's great. I like Americans, you know, but I, I think it's important to, to also have an identity, especially for, for people who don't have the privilege, those people who may come from um, people who were separated from, you know, their, their racial identities and so forth. So I think it's important to, to use that as a tool. I know for me, um, when I got my DNA done, it was like this big deal. And then when I started meeting people um, that were the descendants of the people who enslaved my ancestors, you know, and we started connecting and started having these conversations, it changed my art. You know, it changed my work in the community. And I think projects and programs like that, like, help, helps to, you know, enforce what we're trying to do when we're saying identity is important, just as important as culture, you know? And uh, yeah, so we, we have all these little sections and these, these programs, but all of that comes through um, and is um, built on the foundation of our mentorship program. Um, and that mentorship program works just as simple as from me to you know, Rashad, from Rashad to Ryan, you know, we just keep doing that. And over the, the past 12 years, you know, we've kept passing on um, what we're doing to, to other people in our community and outside of our community. And hopefully they'll take and, and make that same promise to continue to do that for other people. And on top of it all, I mean, obviously, urban artistry is not just about dance. No, no. <laughs> and, and as you were saying, this a holistic understanding of not just dance culture, right? Just culture mm -hmm. and identity and community and how to foster those senses. Um, but I do know you also, on top of it all, uh, urban artistry puts on 20 plus events a year. Yeah. And yes. they range in, in all, all sorts of art forms. Uh, would someone want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I can talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> Just when you said 20, I was like, wow, is it really that much? Um, That's I what mean, he said. <laughs> <laughs> so, so throughout the year, we're really trying to, to show how three-dimensional we are. Like House, uh, I'm sorry, Junius, <laughs> um, really instilled in us that it's important to show range in, in our thinking. It's important to show range in our art and, and value all the, all the things that we can be. And so with that, we try to extend that to a local community, a national community, and then international. Um, so some of the events that we're doing here will be connected to the preservatory project, where we'll hold like um, presentations and um, we'll have like a projector out and, and have people see the interviews that took place and we'll discuss them. Um, sometimes we're doing panel discussions where we'll talk about um, conflict resolution, you know, how do, we, how do we deal with the battle after it was done? You know, are we gonna stay in our egos or are we gonna try and figure out how to come together and, and work through these solutions and not be all in our head and sensitive about these things and mm -hmm. learning from our past. Um, we'll do uh, some events that are a bit more broad and we'll, we'll like connect dance with poetry or we'll do some theater productions. Um, and we'll try to do some performances for children. I think we did one at the Discovery Theater not like a couple weeks ago. Um, we also just did a performance in uh, Glen Falls, New York, you know, where we try to talk about current events, you know, through through theater, you know, and, and put our our personal stories on the stage, you know, for people to get that as well. Um, once a year, we have the International Soul Society Festival. Um, I believe the first one was like 2009. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and that week is just like full of art. It's dance, it's, it's conversation, it's eating, you know, it's the laughter, it's the tears, it's the, and so it's, I mean, 20 events, actually that might not be how many events we're really doing, you know, because we live this thing. Mm -hmm. And so we don't stop. 
You know, every, this happens every day. You know, we wake up and it's like our time clock is just always on. Yeah. You know, we don't get to, get to cut that off like everyone else. And, and I think that's the work that isn't really visible um, when it comes to urban dance because there, there isn't this academia, there isn't this school that we can go to. We can't, you know, wake up in the morning and, and clock in and be, okay, I'm gonna be, the, the, this just doesn't happen. So we're making our way from nothing, you know? And the mentorship prop, um, really helps foster how we can make that happen better for ourselves. You know, we, we look at all the mistakes that we made and we go, okay guys, we gotta shape up, you know? And this is where we start to, to work in the loyalty and the respect for each other. This is when we start to check each other and be like, dude, you messed that up. Or oh, girl, you, you need to get this better. And so these are, these are all our events, you know? The conversations that are tough, the conversations that are really easy, you know? And we just really wanna make sure that we are not unsung heroes, mm -hmm. you know? We want, to be, we want to be in the forefront. Here we are and be as, as honest as we can so that people can feel this thing and, and, and see that this, is, this takes a lifetime of work and even something that we might not even be around for, you know, and hope that it can carry on through some other people, my kids, their kids, you know, like this is, this is where we're going, so. I think one of the things that that was key for me is that when I moved here in 2005 from Europe, in Europe there were all of these uh, different crews and all of these these dance schools and dance programs um, that were well funded, and you know we had corporate sponsors. You know, like when we had shows, we could go to Puma or or go to like Nike and like, you know, ask them for gear and you know, like they give us gear. I was like, wow, this is great, you know? And when I came back to the States, you know, we didn't have that, you know, like some of these things weren't accessible. So an important lesson like to teach everyone was like, you know, sometimes the money's not gonna be there to ask for. So we have to be able to fund our own programming, you know? Yes, we can, you know, write grants and request, you know, and ask people to, to donate. But for the most part, if we're waiting for that, that handout, so to speak, or if we're waiting for, for that blessing, then we could be waiting forever. You know, we could miss the opportunity to, to be who we are because we were waiting for someone else to come and do it for us. You know, so we had to invest. And once you personally invest, you know, it's like, okay, you know, I love this even more. <laughs> you know, I paid for it, I earned it, you know? And it, that's a joke, but it's real, you know? And, it, and I, think, I think for me, that was the, the drive behind that, you know? Coming here and seeing all of these talented people, you know, investing in things that didn't want to invest in them. You know, I mean, yeah, let's, it's fine that we meet like in the club on Saturday and Sunday and get down with, why don't we meet on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, somewhere else and do something to make sure that our organization is run better, you know, uh, to make sure that we create more opportunities for each other and, you know, especially when it came to, to dance schools, like only most of the dance organizations were attached to dance schools, you know? And I didn't come from that. So my idea was like, well, let's just build dance crews and, you know, a dance company. And people were like, whoa, well, what dance school do you guys, you know, are you guys a part of? We were like, what does that mean? Oh yeah, we rent space from this dance school. You know, oh, we're, an art, we're you know, in residence at this dance school, you know, but we are an independent organization of independent people, you know, with a lot of ideas and a lot of drive and a lot of hard work, you know? And I think that goes back to like, that was the spark that I, I saw, like when I came here, it was like, man, so many talented people. But that was like, that was really tough, you know, like, 
to, to kind of put ourselves out there and be like, you know, hey guys, you know, we can do better, you know? And a lot of people disagree, you know? That like, you know, some people were just happy with what they got, you know? And I was doing my best not to seem like a, a big headed dude, but be like, hey, you know, there's other things out there. There's other opportunities, guys, if you, you know, uh, if you go to this country, they're doing this. You go to this country, they're doing that. You know, and some people, some people got it. You know, and I think that that's what makes me happy. You know, like that that people got it and they signed up for the work. And you know, twelve years later, like people are still working. You know, how are we doing? Can we keep going, or what? What, what do you suggest? How are you guys doing? Number one. Yeah, yeah, you feel okay? Not too yeah. hot? Okay. It's hot. But. Yeah, it's a little, <laughs> a little hot. A little hot? Or how about um, um, I ask just two more questions? Uh, you keep it as brief as you like? Okay. So, um, uh, for those who are interested in checking out uh, a little more uh, what urban artistry does, or even to uh, check out some classes at the Dance Academy, how would they go about that? Or uh, You can just reach us at uh, urbanartistry.org. And uh, yeah, you know, have our class schedules there, our events, what we're doing, our staff, and so forth. And is there anything they need to do to mentally prepare ahead of time? Oh man, just, I would say just be open, you know, like be as open as you want people to be open to you. Like, you know, we're, we're an organization that's like very serious about our art forms, but we're also very serious about being kind to people and creating community, so that counts too. Like, we're not gonna hip hop cop you to death, you know, like, uh, we, we want people to come and be a part of our community, like, but we're also interested in learning about them as well. So just come with an open mind. Cool. Um, for each of you, uh, and you can answer this, of course, however you'd like, what does the future hopefully have in store uh, for urban artistry, which you're all so dedicated to, but personally as well? For me, uh, more traveling. Uh, there's so many more countries that I are, that are on my list that I would love to visit. Um, that's that's my that's my thing. I would love to see more of the world. That's that's definitely a future. It's, <laughs> that's definitely going to happen. I think uh, this is something that's already in the works, but the education that we provide at the academy is very collegiate. It's I feel it's on a level that you know, this type of programming would fit very well into universities. And I'd like to see universities all over America, including urban dance programming, you know, something you could major in. Because I know if, if I had that option when I was in college, I would have, I would have chose to do that. So I think that's, that's one big thing for me. Yeah. I think um, more recently I've been inspired by a talk we had a couple weeks ago. Um, and it was mentioned that we're all farmers. Um, and this really registered because the idea that a farmer cultivates land, um, you know, to feed people, the, uh, you try to make sure that your land doesn't get poisoned. And, and, and this, like, metaphor, like, really hit home because um, I'm a dad, you know, so I have two little girls, nine and, and four. And so I, I thought about them immediately. And then I looked back on all the work that we've been doing and I was like, wow, okay, this is, this is it. Like, we're farmers. And so I just want to continue to extend, you know, giving out healthy education and, and building like healthy relationships with people like around the world. So that's what I want to do. It's wonderful. I know you also consider yourself a farmer. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. To the day I die. And then some. Um, you know, I, this is who I am. And the work that we do is just what I want to continue doing. And, you know, we have a lot of goals. But, you know, I think my main goal is to, to not stop doing great things, you know and the communities that, that I, I practice in, you know, to, to just keep enjoying life. You know, it, it's work, but, you know, it's heart work. You know, it's stuff that makes me feel good. It's stuff that, you know, that I know that I can, you know, pass on to others. So, you know, my wish and my goal is to, 
just keep being us and you know, keep helping people who want the help. And if there's anything else you'd like to add or something I should ask if you feel a little better. Are we good? We ready to take a nap? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.